I'm grateful that our panelists and those of you viewing this have joined us for this wonderful occasion. Before we get to the main event, I do want to point out particular people for a word of gratitude. First, our celebration today would not be possible without the sponsorship of the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law and the William T. Dunn Class of 55 Ethics Program Endowed Fund. I also wanna recognize Mrs. Peggy Elder, who I'm sure is not on, the Ethics Program Senior Administrative Assistant, uh, who helped with the administrative aspects of this event. At this time, I'd like to invite Father Peter Donahue, President of the University, to offer a word of greeting. He has been at nearly all of the Praxis Award events over the last 15 years, and I appreciate his support of the program and this event in particular. Father Peter. Thank you, Mark. Did I miss one? You said nearly all of them. I think you did one. Oh, okay. I'm sorry I missed that. <laughs> uh, I'm glad I'm here for this one, though. And um, I hope Mr. Quo will be here soon as well. It's only taken us a year to get him here. So uh, hopefully we'll work through this virtual nightmare to get him on screen. But um, I couldn't help but think that, you know, what we've all experienced in the last couple of weeks, uh, just the, the influx of immigration into the United States and some of the problems that it caused. But I, I had two incidences that I, I saw the, uh, the news last night and I read in the New York Times this morning. Um, one was about a 10 year old boy from Nicaragua, I believe that was found walking alone down a dusty road in the desert of uh, Texas and had gotten waylaid from the group of people that he was with that he came into the country. And here's this 10 year old by himself um, and the immigration uh, border patrol found him and took care of him. And then the other one was um, a group of people in New York City that stood inside a building watching uh, an Asian woman being beat up on the street uh, and did nothing to do anything to stop it until after the perpetrator had already left her there lying on the sidewalk and she was 60 some years old. We've all heard stories over the last couple of months over people with um, directing hatred towards Asian people. We have seen people directing their, their anger towards immigration problems. Uh, we have seen people trying to build walls and keep people out. And you know, we, I, I look at where we are in this institution of Villanova that it actually started as a place to welcome immigrants. It was a place that was founded to educate immigrants. And I often say that I think we continue to do that. We all come from different places. We come from different backgrounds, we come from different cultures, families, faiths, orientations, all different kinds of things. And we come as uh, immigrant people to a place to gain new hopes, new dreams, to accomplish new things. And so today in this Praxis Award, we're honoring a man who's dedicated his life to helping people find that place called home, uh, find that place to really be inst instrumental in helping them achieve their dreams, uh, help their families, help them prosper, uh, a promise that this United States was founded on many, many years ago. This country is filled with immigrants that has been over the whole beginning of this nation. Um, and we came as people to invade the land of another people. Uh, and so we, we have to be mindful of all of the things that our ancestors have gone through that our people have gone through day in and day out. So with that, I see Stuart Quo's name on the screen. So he must be here. So uh, welcome to Villanova University. Mark, take it away. Well, thank you, Father Peter. And yes, Mr. Quo is here. Fantastic. Sorry about those technical challenges, but uh, we've got them resolved. Um, Harry Ravenel, Hello. professor of law. Hello, Hello Stuart. We're at, we're we're we've started. We're doing some introductions. Okay. Yes. All Thank right. You. I'm sorry. I had technical problems. No worries. You're here. Okay. So Terry Ravenel is the, a professor of law and the associate dean for faculty research and development with, at the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law, and she is the spark for this event. She may not know that. So when planning our on-campus uh, event last April, 
uh, Professor Ravenel asked if we could arrange for Mr. Quo to have lunch with the law students. And that was a great idea. And um, in our shift to this, this year, we thought this webinar would be a great way to, to do that to some degree. Um, and so I invite Professor Ravenel to offer a word of greeting. Thank you so much, Mark. And um, I'm glad to know I was the spark behind that ignited that change, if I dare use that phrase. Um, so as you all know, I am Terry Ravenel. I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Dean for Faculty Research and Development at the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law. And I am simply delighted to be here today. Um, I'm honored to be a part of this event. Um, I'm, I'm just flattered to be included at all. Uh, and I'm so grateful to be here with all of you, but especially with our honoree, Mr. Stuart Quo, uh, our 2020 Praxis Award recipient. Uh, you know, Mr. Quo, on behalf of the Charles Widger School of Law, congratulations and thank you. Uh, thank you for your work towards creating a more just and equitable world. Thank you for promoting a broader understanding of the common good. Um, as most of you know, Mr. Quo co-founded Advancing Justice LA back in 1983. And this is the nation's largest Asian American legal and civil rights organization. And so for almost 40 years, as its name suggests, Advanced Justice has done exactly that. It has advanced justice for Asian Americans and more broadly for all persons who are in the United States in the fields of immigration law, employment law, housing, family law, fair housing rights, civil rights. And this work is so very important. And so we are so grateful for the work that you have done and that you continue to do. Uh, the recent violence against Asian and Pacific Island Americans and the immigrants seeking refuge at our Southern border is a really stark reminder of how vital this work is and continues to be. And so know that we at Charles Widger School of Law and Villanova University as a whole stand with you. We are so grateful for your work and we are honored to honor you today. So thank you for being with us. All right, well, thank you, uh, Professor Ravenel. And well, now I'd like to introduce the two Villanova Law students who will introduce the panel and facilitate the discussion. So I'm delighted to uh, introduce Melanie Dedarian. Mel is a third year law student at Villanova Law. She received her BA from Villanova University graduating in three years with magna cum laude honors. Mel served as a student, as student attorney in the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law's Clinic for Asylum, Refugee and Immigrant Services, CARES, for one year throughout her second and third years in law school. After graduation, Mel will be joining the Department of Justice as a judicial law clerk at the Boston Immigration Court. We also have, I'm reading and I'm also manipulating these pictures, so bear with me. Um, Catherine Keppels. Catherine is a third year law student who is a student attorney in the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law's Clinic for Asylum, Refugee and Immigrant Services, where she represents individuals who have fled human rights abuses in their countries of origin in their pending removal proceedings. She joined CARES in her second year at Villanova. After graduation, she hopes to continue working with asylum seekers and others seeking to remain in the US, working with immigrant communities to help address inadequate access to legal services and advancing efforts for expanding quality universal legal representation as a public interest immigration attorney. So Mel and Catherine, I'll turn this over to you. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, I am here to introduce Mr. Stuart Quo as the recipient of the 2020 Praxis Award in Professional Ethics. Mr. Quo is the President Emeritus, Founder, Past President, and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles, or Advancing Justice LA. Mr. Quo is a nationally recognized leader and expert in race relations, Asian American studies, nonprofit organizations and philanthropies, civil rights, and legal services. He was named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow in 1998, becoming the first Asian American attorney and human rights activist to receive this highly prestigious recognition, often referred to as the Genius Grant. Mr. Quo earned his bachelor's degree from the University of California, Los Angeles, and his JD from the UCLA School of Law. He teaches at the university's Asian American Studies Department and has been an instructor at UCLA School of Law. He is a past expert in residence at UC Berkeley School of Law and has two honorary doctorates from Williams College and Suffolk School of Law. In 1983, as Professor Ravenel pointed out, Mr. Quo co-founded Advancing Justice LA, the nation's largest Asian American legal and civil rights organization that serves more than 15,000 individuals and organizations every year. Advancing Justice LA's mission is to advocate for civil rights, provide legal services and education, and build coalitions to positive, positively influence and impact Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and to create a more equitable and harmonious society. Mr. Quo has written extensively and has co-authored two publications, Uncommon Common Ground, Race and America's Future, and Untold Civil Rights Stories. Untold Civil Rights Stories has been described by Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa as a social milestone that recognizes the unsung contributions of Asian Americans to America's civil rights movement. Please join us in welcoming Mr. Stuart Quo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mel. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, and thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Father. Uh, thank you, Dean Rabinal of the uh, School of uh, the Charles Winter School of Law. Uh, again, thank you, Mel, and thank you, Catherine. Uh, I really appreciated the 2020 Practice Award. Um, I had never been to Villanova, but I had heard many great things about it. And of course, Mark told me many other great things about it. So I, uh, I believed him. Uh, you talked about uh, being a genius. I'm not a genius. Uh, my sons can attest to that. My wife can attest to that. And I have no idea how to fix technology. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I was uh, late today. Uh, I got a little bit desperate uh, as uh, it, the uh, message said, Please wait, uh, your webinar will begin shortly. Uh, but anyway, I appreciate the uh, award. Uh, I just wanted to talk about two things today. Um, I'll try to keep it short, but uh, one is there has been a lot of movement on immigration and I, I will uh, recount uh, what President Biden has uh, uh, proposed. And by the way, the um, honorary doctorate at uh, Suffolk University Law School in the 1990s, I received that with then Senator uh, uh, Biden. Um, I also want to touch on the anti-Asian violence. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the thoughts I've had about how to uh, stop the violence. And I would love to uh, hear from you later, if not today. Uh, so uh, President Biden has uh, suggested uh, changes in our immigration uh, laws. And there's four uh, proposals that he's made. On uh, February 18th, he proposed the US Citizenship Act that would include a path to citizenship for 11 million undocumented immigrants. 
Uh, the No Ban Act uh, introduced on February 25th uh, would ensure that no administration can ever enact a ban like Trump's xenophobic Muslim and African bans. Number three, the Dream and Promise Act introduced on March 3rd would provide a long overdue relief and stability to an estimated 2.5 million undocumented youth and long-term residents in this country. And fourth, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 was introduced on March 6th. Uh, this would provide COVID-19 relief bills uh, that would include more immigrant families who then would be eligible for stimulus checks. Um, in uh, May of this year, the governor of the state of California asked uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice LA to provide um, a service because he was going to authorize a $500 check to undocumented individuals and a thousand per family. He got sued by some conservative groups, but nevertheless, he went ahead. Uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice was the only Asian group in the state of California that took up his offer and provided um, checks for 8,500 individuals. To show, um, the father gave an example of um, an immigrant in need. I would just say on May 18th, when that program began, we got 90,000 calls, 90,000 calls. And every day that week, we got about 90,000 calls. So these are, these workers, are in the front lines of saving lives, of providing us food, uh, providing other uh, safety initiatives, and they were not given anything in the stimulus relief programs. So we're still fighting that battle as well as all these other three uh, immigration bills. Uh, none of them have been um, really passed, uh, but they're being discussed uh, by, for, for example, Congresswoman Judy Chu and others are promoting these immigration bills around the country. Um, we don't know if they can be passed because they would, in, they would need some Republican um, support and so uh, the Biden administration has said he is willing to split up some of these bills in order to get something passed. Um, in my estimation, it's most likely that the Dream and Promise Act in uh, helping the dreamers um, may be the best bet to get through the Congress because to enact all four immigration bills would um, be a miracle, a uh, wel welcome miracle, uh, but I, I'm not sure if we, as our country is so polarized, uh, it may not work. So uh, President Biden has signaled that uh, he's willing to split up the bills and see what could be passed. Uh, the second thing I wanted to touch on today, again, um, thanking Villanova University for the Practice Award. None of us anticipated the pandemic when I got the award. None of us anticipated that the pandemic would unleash a new epidemic of violence against Asian Americans. Uh, none of us anticipated that George Floyd would be killed and uh, his trial uh, would, would be happening now. Uh, but those things have come to pass and we're trying to deal with the situation as best we can. Uh, for the violence against Asian Americans, several groups do tracking 
Uh, we have a stand, stand against hatred tracking um, system. S uh, Stop API Hate has even a broader uh, national uh, tracking system. We've tracked over 3,000 incidents, hate crimes and hate incidents against Asian Americans in the last year. Um, unfortunately, as people know, in March, um, eight people were killed in Atlanta, Georgia. Six uh, being Asian American women uh, were gunned down. And uh, others have been pushed to the ground or beaten up. Uh, some have died in the Bay Area and in New York City. Um, I, I have a long uh, talk that I've been giving to different groups on the anti-Asian violence, but let me just mention two things that we're working on that would be uh, hopefully of interest to your um, university and uh, the participants today. Number one, um, in the face of this tragedy, uh, we think that there is a unfortunate, but an opportunity to bring people together around racial justice. Um, I feel that it is uh, incumbent on the United States, our country, to uh, try to rectify the injustices against uh, racial minorities. As long as Asian Americans are seen as the other, as the enemy, as um, people who bring in diseases from other countries like China, uh, will always be targeted. As long as Blacks are uh, targeted by police uh, for their rage and anger and frustration, uh, as long as they're seen as the other, uh, we will not be fulfilling our aspirations of a multiracial democracy. As long as Latino immigrants are seen as the other, they could be held on the Southern border uh, for, for months uh, and the children suffering uh, by the day. As long as they're seen as the other, uh, we will not have a multiracial democracy to speak of. Uh, so it is my view that uh, the two things that I'd like to lift up for your consideration today is that we need to build the multiracial unity. How do we do that? It's nice to have a statement. It's nice to have a comment. And, and I'm proud of Asian Americans speaking out around the country. But how do you build the multiracial unit uh, in a practical uh, immediate sense. Um, I think that one thing that uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice LA is doing and the DC and Chicago uh, affiliates have already done this, I think San Francisco may have done this too, is we're trying to have bystander trainings. What people who are um, bystander witnesses could do to prevent or stop hate incidents from happening. Uh, yelling, screaming, whistling, whatever uh, can be done. Uh, you may have seen in New York, a 65 year old woman was kicked to the ground and uh, there were two or three doormen who, this, uh, who witnessed this event and simply closed the door. Uh, they were working for an apartment building and they simply closed the door. Um, we have to have bystander training where Asians, but in particular non-Asians are standing up and saying that should not happen. We have to yell, scream, uh, do something to stop those incidents. The other, the other part of that is I believe Asian Americans need to, um, they have awakened to the violence, but they need to fully join the fight for racial justice. So uh, Asian Americans 
need to speak up for affirmative action, need to speak up for police reform that is in Congress right now, need to speak against voter suppression, which is happening in Georgia as we speak. Uh, they need to speak up that they are part of the movement for racial justice. It's not good enough to say, stop violence against me. Uh, they, need to, they need to speak up against violence, against all people of color and everybody in the country. The second thing I just wanted to raise up is my wife and I have been working um, on a curriculum uh, for Asian Americans for 14 years. And I'm pleased to say we've actually uh, come to a crucial point because we finished uh, 36 lesson plans uh, based on the PBS documentary in May, um, uh, just in February, just last month. And uh, so we have those 36 lesson plans and we have 12 from my book uh, untold civil rights stories, Asian Americans speak up for justice. So we actually have 48 lesson plans that we just released today. In fact, uh, we just sent out a press release today. You can um, look at our new website. It is called asianamericanedu.org. Again, it's simple, asianamericanedu.org. All those lesson plans are available for Villanova, for, um, but they're mainly geared for K through 12. Uh, we, th we have to get our young students to understand the contributions, the struggles, the challenges of Asians and Blacks, Latinos and Native Americans in our country. Uh, this, uh, we are starting a free uh, trainings for teachers on April 18th. And we've already been contacted by the California Teachers Association, the American Federation of Teachers, uh, the California Superintendent of Schools and schools around the country, like in New York, uh, Connecticut um, and uh, Colorado and other, and other states. So I, I, lift, I lift that up to you uh, in case you uh, have contacts with teachers, we welcome them to join us in this um, important endeavor to spread the uh, history of Asian Americans. And we added a, a lesson on how to, how to see the current wave of violence against Asian Americans as well. Uh, so Mark, let me stop there and see if there's any questions. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Kuo. I just wanted to emphasize that if anybody has any questions uh, throughout the process, please feel free to use the Q&A function um, as well. I also wanted to quickly introduce Professor uh, Michelle Pistone, who will also be joining our conversation today. Professor Pistone is a professor of law and the founder and director of the Clinic for Asylum, Refugee and Emigrant Services, also known as CARES at the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, Mr. Kuo, we wanted to start off with a question specifically for you. Um, given the recent deportations of Vietnamese immigrants and the rise in hate crimes perpetrated against the Asian American Pacific Islander community, how would you describe the barriers your clients are currently facing with the immigration system specifically? And how would you say those barriers have changed or stayed the same for Asian American immigrants? Uh, unfortunately, the uh, laws uh, continue. Uh, they have not been repealed yet on the Vietnamese um, uh, residents. Uh, what had happened is that under President Trump, some old laws were uh, reinstituted and uh, where Vietnamese may have been involved in some criminal activity, uh, but served their time, fulfilled the, the sentence uh, the 
the laws have been used to then revoke their residency and order, order these people uh, deported. And we have uh, been representing some of them, uh, especially in our San Francisco office, uh, but that we have been representing them. Uh, we've gotten a short reprieve because some of them were released, some of the um, individuals who were arrested uh, and ready to be deported, but because of the coronavirus, uh, there was a short reprieve so that some of them have not been deported. Uh, but that law still continues where even though um, individuals of Vietnamese background have served their time, they're still being um, threatened with deportation. The irony is that in many cases the, in Vietnam and Cambodia, they're not accepting these people to come back. So these people are incarcerated and they're held in limbo. Uh, so they're, they're without, um, with, really without a country. So it's a very uh, tragic situation and we've been representing them uh, some with success, but uh, we're, we're still fighting the, the good fight for these individuals. Thank you, Mr. Quo. And Mr. Quo and Professor Pistone, as we know, the previous administration, the previous administration's immigration policies included heightened enforcement, arrest, and removal of immigrants. These policies continue even with new interim immigration customs enforcement, commonly known as ICE, enforcement guidance, and have left over-policed immigrant communities increasingly vulnerable to arrests and removal. What, if any, actions do you recommend we take to work towards a fair and just system for all immigrants? I'll let the law professor answer first. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot that we can do to improve the system. I think that one of the, one of the, the things that I'm most concerned about is getting people access to legal representation when they are confronting the immigration system. Right now, six out of every 10 immigrants goes to, to immigration court without an advocate and without a, or without a lawyer. And the statistics are really clear that if someone has an advocate, they're 10 times more likely to succeed on the merits of the case. So it's really not even about um, you know, whether someone has a right to stay or not or has access to um, you know, to, to status. It's really about having a voice in the adjudication system so that you can, um, so you can express your rights and you know your rights. I mean, imagine that so many immigrants who are in the immigration system don't speak the language, it's a new culture, they don't understand the law. And even in, in an immig Im immigration court, even children as young as four years old, and I've seen it before my eyes, have to appear in court without a lawyer because unlike our criminal justice system, um, in the civ immigration is a civil matter. And so people aren't entitled to, legal to free legal representation, even children. So I think that's one thing that we could focus on to improve the adjudication system. And I'm also very interested, given my experience in asylum, with these new um, proposals by the Biden administration to figure out how to expedite adjudications of asylum seekers at the southern border. I would just add to uh, what the law professor said is that if um, the Charles Winter School of Law has a immigration um, clinic that we in general need as much help as possible. So people could volunteer uh, these cases um, really are emotional cases. Uh, because many of these people, when, what, for example, when we were helping the undocumented with the $500 check, uh, we had cases of people who um, had cancer and were yet they were living in their cars uh, because they had no place to sleep. And, um, you know, they, they really need help. 
and the uh, remedies uh, may be um, may not always be there, but sometimes they are there, and we need to uh, press their cases as as much as possible. So I would just encourage people to volunteer to uh, join the immigration or deportation clinics in your area, because we we need as many much help as possible. Yeah, so I'll add to that. So I'm the founder of our clinic on a, for, where we represent asylum seekers. And we've been representing asylum seekers at Villanova for more than 20 years. We also have a farm worker clinic and we serve um, farm workers in the region. So in this whole region, Delaware, uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And I also recently just launched a new program. It's the first of its kind in the country uh, from Villanova, and it's to train non-lawyers to become immigrant advocates, including to help people to learn how to accompany immigrants. And that's really, I think, what you're talking about, um, Mr. Quo, when you talk about um, people who are living in their cars and need or need access to checks. Like, there's a lot of work that needs to be done that's not legal work, but but people need to be skilled in how to provide services to immigrants. So we're offering these, these new certificate programs um, in immigrant accompaniment, in immigrant advocacy, and immigration trial advocacy, so that people who don't want to go to law school but want to help immigrants have an ability to learn what they need to do to, so that they can serve the community. And um, I'm proud that like some of my students, so we, we just launched the program in August, and already some of the students who are currently in the program are volunteering. So there are some who went down to Texas and they're working at Annunciation House. We have some that are working with Vecina to help unaccompanied children. We're going to be working with kids in need of defense to provide legal, you know, help to uh, children who are unaccompanied. So we're doing what we can. I mean, as Father Peter said, immigration is really at the core of the founding as a university. And so um, it's tied to our mission. Thank you both so much. Um, there was a quick question in the chat about uh, Mr. Quo. Are the lessons that you mentioned directly available on the website? Yes, the uh, lesson, the 48 lessons are there and we had hired Stanford to uh, develop a teacher's guide. Uh, so they're um, ready to use right now. The, in other words, uh, the 48 lesson plans are available, they're free, and we've uh, grouped them by theme. So for example, immigration is a theme, and there might be four or five lessons uh, that we put together. And so some of the other uh, themes are like racism or civil rights. So uh, teachers could use those uh, immediately, uh, although we, we do have the free training uh, beginning April 18th. And then depending on the demand, we'll have eight to 10 other trainings uh, in the next few months. But we, um, they're, they're ready to use. And if you um, need any training, just contact us and uh, we'll put it on the website, but you could let us know uh, we're getting calls from teachers every day, even though we're just announcing this today. Uh, but people, uh, because of the anti-Asian violence, I think the uh, interest and the needs are picking up. Um, I have a call later today because a group of teachers at a school are being harassed and they don't know what to do about it. Uh, they're actually being harassed by um, their own students who don't know any, you know, uh, purportedly don't know any better, but are calling uh, the teachers coronavirus or virus. Um, so we're trying to deal with um, an emergency situation. Thank you so much. Um, as a follow-up question, uh to shift back to what we were talking before regarding the Biden administration. One big piece of the immigration system that the Biden administration hopes to fix is the massive backlog of asylum cases from the southern border. The administration is considering taking some asylum cases 
from the southern border away from the immigration courts under the Department of Justice and instead giving them to asylum officers in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, this question is for both of you. What do you see as the benefits or negatives to this proposal? And do you agree that it is the best way to resolve the current asylum backlog? I think I'll start. Um, I think it's one way to address the backlog and that it's a very reasonable way. You know, so it's it's interesting because of the way that our laws have developed people who apply for asylum when they're at the border don't get the same um, procedure as those who apply for asylum when they're already in the country. So basically, if someone has entered the United States, maybe they're on a student visa or they came as a as a visitor on a tourist visa or on a work visa, and after they got here, they decide to apply for asylum. They apply first with the with the Department of Homeland Security with USCIS. And they have an an affirmative interview with an asylum officer. So really, what what's being proposed here is that that procedure, which is very effective, less time consuming, much less costly, and much more efficient. Asylum officers grant about thirty thousand cases a year. To have to have those people do the first line of adjudication with cases for people who are coming over the border. And so it's something that seems really reasonable because these are people the the asylum officers who would be doing the adjudications are specifically trained to be asylum to adjudicate these cases and they do them effectively in the asylum office every day. So I think that would be a big step to addressing the backlog. But other problems with the, I mean, there's a lot of problems with the immigration court adjudication system. But one of them is that a lot of immigration judges, unfortunately, aren't even trained in immigration law. And so that's a huge problem when you have adjudicators who don't have a background in immigration law. So we really have to start with better training, we have to use more technology in the immigration court system, make it function faster and easier, but also think of how to take cases out of the court and maybe give them to asylum officers like the Biden proposal. One question that I have that you might be able to answer, uh, under uh, President Trump, the number of asylees uh, was extremely limited. Uh, President Biden has said that he would expand the numbers. Has that been implemented already? So, um, so in terms of people who are coming to the United States as refugees, the Biden administration has expanded the number of people who we invite to the country and who we um, are adjudicated overseas and brought to the country as refugees. So under the Trump administration, that number went down to something close to like 15,000. Now it's back up to 60 and hopefully will be even higher than that. So that's um, for overseas refugee resettlement. With respect to asylum adjudications, each of those cases is adjudicated on a case by case basis. So depending on who the adjudicator is, you know, we have fluctuations in terms of grant rates. But I think historically, um, there are some jurisdictions in which the grant rates are lower than others. But um, I think in this administration, we'll see a return to the grant rates that we've seen in the past. Thank you. And we now have a question in the chat about the use of technology in the immigration system. One attendee was wondering what role has technology taken in immigration proceedings? Has it been effective? And do you see technology as a potential essential tool to the field of immigration? I mean, I'm a big fan of technology and I think that it can be used to make the law more accessible and to, to give more information to people who need to understand the law. And so my, my a simple response to that is yes, I think it can be used both to make the court system more efficient. I think it could also be used to give more information to immigrants about the law so that those who don't have access to a representative or an advocate can at least understand the law and be able to, 
to advocate hopefully for themselves. But I'd love to hear what Mr. Cross says. Yeah, over the years, it's been a um, an ugly running uh, joke that the immigration service is one of the most antiquated uh, departments or agencies in the country. And uh, I can't tell you how many times people have called us and said, I applied for citizenship, but my whole file has been lost and they don't know where it is. And I think it's, it's a shame that that's happened, that these are people who really want to become Americans. Uh, they've gone through all the steps and yet their files have been lost. So I, I fully agree that getting uh, technology up to speed as a service is uh, absolutely important. And it, it's just a shame when people, some people wait years and years and then call us and say, and they finally told me they can't find my file. <laughs> and it, it, it's just a shame, it breaks your heart. Yeah, I mean, I could give you anecdotes from my clients who uh, we filed papers with the government telling them that the clients moved addresses and yet they still get mailed at the former address. And so they don't get notices of times that they have to appear in court because the government hasn't updated its records, even though we've provided the new information. So <laughs> it, it's really about fundamental, right? Like being able to file something, knowing that the government has it, getting a receipt, <laughs> all of that could be done electronically. Uh, we also um, we also file for people, and sometimes uh, they they get their citizenship or their uh, adjudication, but um, sometimes the notices don't get to us. So uh, having a uh, an electronic system that could notify the uh, representatives would be helpful. So yeah. I. I fully uh, agree with having a um, uh, reset and an upgrade. Thank you both for your insights about technology and moving forward. Uh, as the US has the largest immigration detention system in the world and on any given day, more than 50,000 people are subject to detention. How do you see the Biden administration beginning to shift practices at the southern border and in regard to immigration detention specifically? And what are the most urgent issues that still need to be addressed? And are these issues specific to your geographic area or nationwide? Um, I would just say using the example of the Vietnamese uh, who were in limbo and being detained um, there has to be uh, an over, overall review of the immigration laws uh, because a lot of people are still being detained. Some of them were let out because of the coronavirus and not having um, you know, even barely safe conditions to live in. But uh, I, I just think that in the longer term, there has to be an overall review of uh, the laws that are uh, detaining people, because in some cases they're not even covered by these four major bills that I mentioned. And there really has to be review. Otherwise people will be detained once again after the pandemic um, subsides. And uh, I think it's very unfortunate because they, they're, they're stuck in limbo. In, in many cases. So I've been um, trying to fight immigration detention for my whole career at Villanova. In fact, my first article, the one that I wrote to get accepted as a professor was about how immigration detention was unnecessary and unfair. And unfortunately, the government has not listened to what I said in that article. And the immigration system, ha immigration detention system has expanded significantly over the last uh, two, two decades. I think the thing that a lot of people don't know that I think is important for people to know is that there are private companies 
that own and run immigration detention centers. And these private companies are profiting off of the detention of immigrants. And they invest a lot of money in lobbying so that the laws require more people to be detained. And we can all look into our 401ks and our investment portfolios and make sure that we're not investing in these companies. Core Civic is one of them. Um, and the other one used to be called Wackenhut, and I can't remember what it's currently uh, called, but Core Civic. If you just look into your investment portfolios and make sure that you're not investing in a company that's making profit off of the detention of immigrants. So I think that's one thing that we can do to improve the system. And then the other thing, which, you know, frankly, I've been saying for years is that we have really good alternatives to immigration detention. You know, we have a system where we can put, um, right now, I mean, especially with technology, we can figure out how to use GPS to track people so that they don't have to be in detention. Asylum seekers especially have a really strong incentive to appear in immigration court because they, they're looking for an affirmative benefit. They're entitled to asylum if they show up in court. So the likelihood that they appear in court is really, really high. So the reason that one of the, the, the reasons that we detain people, one of them is security. One of them is just that we want to make sure that they appear in immigration court. But we have alternatives that alternative technologies that we can use to ensure people get into immigration court. And um, and we don't have to be spending hundreds of dollars a day of federal money detaining immigrants, especially immigrant children. So the other thing that the Biden administration is doing, which is really exciting, is trying to figure out how to get children processed at the southern border and keep them out of detention. So a lot of groups like Kids in Need of Defense, um, Al Otro Lado, Immigration Law Lab, they're all down there in the southern border. And we can, we're can we looking for volunteers. So if anyone's interested in going to the southern border and helping to process or even just sitting with children and help them as they go through this system, please reach out to us. I just before this call was um, communicating in the defense and they have a lot of opportunities for people, even if you don't have any law background to go and help, especially with um, immigrant children, these unaccompanied immigrant children. I, I would just like to add that um, it's very important for students and uh, professors and all of us to advocate uh, for uh, broader immigration rights, uh, to just say what has happened in the past is just far, far too restrictive, and that we are a country made up of many, many millions of uh, immigrants and people who, uh, who were uh, immigrants. And I think it's just very important to speak up. Uh, we were in, an, in a period where it was very difficult to speak up, but I think speaking up is very important. It, it could be uh, expanding the numbers. It could be getting rid of the private uh, security firms. Uh, for example, I was just interviewed um, by a, a public radio station on the new uh, nominee for the attorney general in California, uh, Rob Bonta. And one of the things he did was he introduced a bill that was passed that banned uh, private uh, for-profit prisons. So I think, um, you know, advocacy is just very important. Uh, helping and joining uh, the legal clinic is very important as well. But I would just say writing a letter, making a call, uh, making your voice heard is just very important right now because uh, there, there's a lot of opposition to the immigration changes that we've described, um, a lot of the opposition. So anybody who could speak up uh, needs to speak up now. Thank you both so much. Um, the next question has to do with um, the rhetoric surrounding immigrants 
So in both of your experiences, how have immigration policies and political rhetoric affected immigrants' interactions with the immigration system? And if possible, I know, um, Mr. Quo, you mentioned dreamers earlier, if you could also define that just because we don't know um, what levels people in the audience uh, have on understanding what dreamers are as well. Thank you. Well, uh, dreamers are the um, long-term uh, children who grew up in the United States, but were brought over uh, as undocumented children. And they've grown up uh, here, uh, for many of them, this is their only country. And we've been trying to get them legal status uh, and a pathway to citizenship for a number of years. So. Uh, they call them dreamers because they are young, uh, still dreaming, and <laughs> so we're we're still trying. Um, there's uh, there's uh, over a million and a half dreamers uh, who, uh, you know, we said 2.5 million are in the uh, Dream and Promise Act bill. They they, they mentioned two and a half million, but there's a lot of uh, young people in particular who are uh, dreamers and hopefully at least that could pass in the next year or so. Uh, that would be a, a big step forward. And I think one thing, I, I just wanna to touch on something that um, Mr. Cross said earlier, which is um, how we need to, how we need to stop seeing people as the other and start in the words of Pope Francis, create a culture of encounter. Um, because when we encounter the other and when we understand the other and we're in community with the other, that we see that they're not the other, right? That they're not different than us, that we're all human, we're all made in the image of God and that we all are, are aspiring for, this, to this, for the same things being with our families, being able to provide for our families, right? Being able to live in security, knowing that we're not gonna get beaten up if we walk down the street. And, um, and I think, you know, as a nation, we really have to start working on that. And I know that at Villanova we are, but I just wanted to ground it in this really central social teaching of the culture of encounter. And by working with immigrants, you can encounter people from different cultures and it, it opens your eyes to how similar we really all are. <laughs> I remember yeah. when I was young, I went to China when I was in college and, um, and I was in this like rural area in a house with a dirt floor and someone came out with a boom box and started pay playing like a song that i listened to in the united states and i just opened my eyes and i'm like look we're all the same we're all the same we're all excited about the same things it was a very moving experience to have at that like formative time in my life yeah to to build on that the um the other, uh, what Asian Americans have suffered through is uh, being called the coronavirus, uh, the Chinese virus, the Wuhan virus. The reason that has been, um, you know, the different organizations, uh, international organizations have said to label diseases by the country or by an ethnicity uh, labels the whole country and labels the whole ethnicity. And uh, Trump, uh, President Trump may have done that out of his desire to uh, fight the Chinese on a world stage, but the collateral damage were Asian Americans because they are seen, they, they were seen through the lens of being the Chinese virus. Um, the Wuhan virus, the Kung flu. And so when you use that terminology um, out of a joke or out of being serious, you label the whole, uh, the whole group. So anybody who looks like people from that country, anybody who looks like they're Chinese. And so uh, many Americans cannot distinguish 
from a Chinese uh, from China and a Chinese American or an Asian American. So it, it influences all Asian Americans. And uh, it's a very unfortunate use of uh, a derogatory term that labels a whole, a whole ethnic group, a whole country. And it's uh, really, um, you know, we, we all lose when people do that because then um, even if uh, China does something wrong, then Asian Americans suffer. And that, that just is not uh, our aspiration as a country to treat people uh, equally, to treat them as Americans. Uh, my daughter-in-law spoke at a rally in, um, in Phoenix against the anti-Asian violence. And our gra my granddaughter, who's six years old, uh, went to the stage with my daughter-in-law and she's, um, she said, I'm, I may be small, but I can make a big impact. And, uh, you know, we, we just all have to speak out because that kind of labeling of people is just unnecessary, uh, counterproductive, and un-American. Thank you both. And how have the blind spots surrounding detention, both the marketing of detention facilities as a way to keep jailing immigrants, and now the rebranding of family detention centers, specifically Carnes and Dilly as reception centers, and the rural location of detention facilities impacted individuals' access to justice? Um, well, the fact that immigration detention centers are in rural areas significantly impacts access to legal representation. So in the Pennsylvania area, there's a detention center, in the Philadelphia area, I should say, there's a detention center in York, Pennsylvania. And when that detention center, it's a county jail, and they started to house detainees there about 25 years ago. And at the time, there was not a single immigration lawyer in the whole area. And so, um, you know, because because immigration lawyers are were mostly in the city. So they were in Philadelphia, they were in Pittsburgh. But detention centers are are uh, designed and used in these more rural areas. So you have a place like York, where people are being held, hundreds of people are being held, and then and they were no immigration lawyers. The same thing in um, a lot of rural areas in the country like Louisiana and South Dakota. And so we really need to figure out a way to start either getting getting people there or figuring out how to train people who are in those remote areas to be able to provide legal representation. That's what one thing I'm trying to do through my VISTA program. Because it's online and it's available to anyone in the country, we can identify people who want to become part of the solution in those rural areas to be able to provide legal representation. Uh, one story I'll share with you is uh, in 1995, a, a neighbor of mine asked uh, if I could get some Thai speakers to help on a labor raid. And um, he, he uh, I called uh, our young attorney on our staff uh, named Julie Sue, and uh, she got to work on it and the Thai Community Development Center sent some people. And then Julie called me and she said, uh, can we bond out these workers? And I said, what happened? And she said that the, uh, the uh, labor agency went to this former apartment building and it was surrounded by barbed wire and they, uh, the labor inspectors opened up the building and they found 80 uh, workers, uh, 76 women, uh, locked up working as slaves uh, from Thailand. And she had to uh, lead a sit-in in order to see the workers and offer our representation to the workers. Uh, so sometimes you have to go through great lengths to see, even see the workers 
Uh, it might be in a rural area, it might be in an urban area, but sometimes you have to demand to see the workers to offer them legal assistance. Uh, by the way, Julie uh, was um, uh, our litigation director for 17 years. Uh, she is the Secretary of Labor for the state of California. And in two weeks, she's going to be nominated as the uh, Secretary of Labor for the United States of America. So, you know, we can make some headway, uh, but it takes a lot of struggle and persistence. And uh, hopefully Julie makes it through the nomination process, but she will be a great secretary, uh, a deputy secretary of labor uh, for the United States. And so many of the workers who don't have representation now uh, will find it with her advocacy and the advocacy of the new secretary of labor, who was the mayor of Boston, uh, Marty Walsh. So uh, Julie Sue, S-U is her name. So uh, please, please tell your um, senators and uh, particularly senators to support her. Thank you both so much. Um, we're going to be transitioning now into a quick question regarding the intersection of inter immigration law and criminal law. So although immigration law is formally termed civil, Congress has increasingly expanded the number of crimes that may render an individual deportable and immigration law violations often lead to criminal prosecutions. Further, local police now play an increasingly active role in immigration enforcement. Consequently, even relatively minor offenses can result in a person being detained in immigration custody and deported, often with no hope of ever returning to the United States. How do you think the intersection between criminal and immigration law impact individuals in removal proceedings? I mean, I think one of the things, and this kind of leads back to something we were talking about earlier about rhetoric, is just that um, immigrants, I think, are increasingly perceived as criminals. And it's because of the expanding definitions of, um, cr of crimes that make people deportable. You know, um, there's a term in the immigration code, um, aggravated felony. And if you commit an aggravated felony, you're potentially deportable. Well, oh. a lot of the crimes that are on that list aren't felonies <laughs> at all. And yet the, the definition in the code is a felony. So people are, assume that there are people who have done these horrendous crimes, and yet it could be as minor as possession, possession of a small amount of, um, of marijuana or driving under the influence or something that is not really, is not considered a felony in the criminal justice system. So I think that that's one of the consequences, just like perceiving immigrants as criminals. And uh, uh, vice versa, uh, or on the opposite, and those people who um, may have uh, committed some minor crime, uh, but served their time, are now uh, considered deportable. So uh, that, that's a big problem in the Vietnamese community, the, where uh, people um, may have committed a minor crime, Serve their time, serve their sentence. Uh, they could be an upstanding citizen for years and years, and yet they are tabbed to be deported uh, because they uh, at one time broke the law. And that's where uh, a number of uh, Vietnamese and Cambodians have been caught in a limbo situation where they're, uh, they can't go anywhere but they're being detained. So I think, um, like I said, a reset and a review of all of our laws, uh, we, we just have to do that because uh, there's so much unfairness in the system. It just be, it needs to be looked at. Uh, I would just add one other thing that uh, we continue to advocate for uh, fair uh, immigration for families. Um, 
under uh, President Trump, there were uh, suggestions to get rid of the family immigration system altogether. And so, um, and there had been past uh, suggestions to get rid of brother, the brother and sister category or other categories. And so we're still fighting to uphold family immigration in addition to uh, labor-based uh, immigration. And the family immigration has been the, the cornerstone of our immigration system. And uh, I think it should continue into the future. I think we have time for one more question for both of you. Moving forward, what structural reforms do you think would help create an immigration system that is more humane and more navigable, especially for those who do not have access to representation? Well, I'll just uh, say a brief uh, word that I think the examination of all of our immigration laws has to come from the standpoint of America being uh, largely an immigrant country. And we need to uh, determine uh, which path forward. Are we going to continue being a welcoming country for immigrants uh, around the world? Uh, based on that kind of viewpoint, we could figure out the numbers, we can figure out a fair system, uh, we can figure out uh, how and when uh, immigrants should have legal representation. But unless we make up our minds um, on, are we gonna be an immigrant friendly country or not? Uh, the country will continue to be split <clears throat> um, around those who just think immigrants are terrible for the country and those who welcome immigrants. So I think that has to be a starting point. I mean, I think that's a great point to end on because it's really global in terms of what kind of a country are we? Do we consider ourselves a nation of immigrants? Are we gonna live up to the promise of the Statue of Liberty and our, our, um, our um, ancestors? I mean, I did research on the, the the members of, of the, the people who signed the Constitution of the United States, so many of them came here as re, either came here as refugees or had come because their families had to flee persecution. So it's really at the core of who we are as a nation. The state of Pennsylvania, in which we're, I'm sitting right now, was founded by William Penn as a safe haven for people fleeing religious persecution. I mean, to me, it is at the core of who we are as a nation. And I think we need to, as a community, just make a decision on that and then move forward. Because as, uh, you know, as otherwise, we're going to be in this battle during, you know, every administration. Thank you both so much. We're going to hand it over to Mark Dorley now. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been great. Um, I am doing two things at the same time, so just bear with me. Okay, so uh, we're all should be on the screen. You can see us all. I want to thank Mel and Catherine for a wonderful uh, facilitation, and and Mr. Quo and um, Professor Pistone. Fantastic. Uh, it's exactly what I imagined we would have. And I want to thank Father Peter for being here and Professor Ravenel. Um, thanks everyone. Was, we were up to 90 people at one point, which is quite, quite, quite uh, wonderful that people got to hear about the opportunities they have to, to um, pursue justice for our immigrant brothers and sisters. Um, so a recording of this event will be made available on the website, the ethics program website for, uh, for future reference. Thanks again to everyone. Thanks for all the work that went into making this possible. And I'm so glad, Stuart, that we got you on. We, we worked at it. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye, Mark. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Yeah.